everyone. Good afternoon. So this myth, um, honestly, I came across this when a senior resident, Dr. Freed, mentioned it, and I ha when I had no ideas for my Mythbusters. And because I'm interested in Hemonc, I was like, why not? I'll look into this. I'm not sure if anyone else in this room has even heard of this before, but why 20,000 and why fever? So I decided to look into it. So I'm gonna start with the background in platelet transfusions, where this threshold came from, costs and complications of transfusions, <clears throat> and uh, why does this matter at the end of the day? So looking at when we try to look up a platelet transfusion order here at Cottage, you know, we have these different thresholds, 10,000, 20,000, and 50,000. Um, I think everyone pretty much knows about the 10,000 and 50,000, but this 20,000, where is it from? And even here, it doesn't really mention fever. It just talks about some bleeding. So platelet transfusions, we do around 2.2 million of these annually in the US. And most of the time, majority of this is done for uh, hematological patients that have thrombocytopenia after chemo or are needing trans, uh, stem cell transplants. And the cost of these uh, transfusions range from 5,000 to 13,000 back in 2017. So I'm sure the costs have gone up significantly since then. And ideally, after one unit of platelets, it sh uh, platelet count should increase by 35 to 40,000 after 10 minutes and then uh, after an hour as well. But unlike regular blood products, platelets actually need more special care and more higher attention. They need to be stored at room temperature, which limits the shelf life. And this is, you know, that information came from studies that showed, you know, if the platelets have been left out longer, they actually, um, they're, they're, they undergo apoptosis and there's fewer counts in the units in, over time. So that's why there's uh, strict regulations and in general, these are limited resources because we need people to donate these. All right, so in this, uh, in these couple articles here, um, they were looking at the risk factors associated with platelet uh, and red blood cell transfusions. In general, platelet transfusions actually cause more uh, transfusion reactions more than red blood cell transfusions, which is interesting because I didn't realize that before. And uh, that's around 30 times more than red blood cell transfusions. Uh, and then the other one was with transfusions, especially platelet transfusions, there's increased risks of uh, venous thromboembolisms and, you know, there's higher in hospital mortality after tra uh, platelet transfusions. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's better to give them more platelets if the platelet transfusion threshold was increased. So where did this threshold come from? So honestly, it took me a long time to try to find the origin of this myth. Um, everything really that talked about this 20,000 threshold came from this initial paper in 1962. Um, they looked at 92 hematological patients with AML um, and ALL. And they saw that at certain ranges of platelet counts, patients were uh, at higher risk of bleeding, uh, gross hemorrhage at certain levels. Obviously, they, you know, at, depending on the counts from 0 0.8 days with a platelet count of 20,000 to 50,000 and 0 0.07 days when the platelet counts above 100,000. But that's a huge range, you know. So for us, we don't really, well, I guess we do have a lot of hematological patients on our service these days, but most of the time it's thrombocytopenic. Do these thresholds even matter for us? So that's one question I had when I saw this. And even from this study, they did not actually look at any evidence-based thresholds to suggest that we need to have a certain level of when platelets should be transfused. So this is something else I found from, the, from ASCO, which is uh, one of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. You know, this is one of the big, big organizations that everyone refers to, especially the hematologists, oncologists, and what I look forward to when I have questions reg uh, regarding hematological patients. And their panel, or in this review, or guideline, they actually said the threshold should be 10,000 uh, and not 20,000. But they say higher levels can be advised for signs of hemorrhage, high fever, hyperleukocytosis, and rapid dropping plate counts. But why? You know, where did this come from? Why did they think in certain situ situations that you need to increase that transfusion threshold? Within that same guideline, they said that they looked at 
a Cochrane review from 2015 that showed three randomized control trials uh, that showed with a total of 500 patients that showed the standard transfusion threshold of 10,000 with a higher threshold of 20,000 or 30,000, there was no significant difference in the risk of bleeding or the, and resulted in lower transfusions in general. So, you know, it's 20, uh, 20 versus 10. This guideline here, you know, from ASCO mentions 20, but at, at the same time, they say, you know, 10 is the magical number. Let's just stick with 10. This slide also kind of supports the same thing. In the first one, they studied um, more hematological patients with AML, and they looked at different thresholds, 20,000 and 10,000, and both of these, they did take into account of fevers. And what they found was, you know, the events of bleeding were actually very similar. Whether it was 10,000 or 20,000 in the febrile patients, the same events of bleeding were minusculely different. And if anything, having that lower threshold re, uh, reduced the use of platelet transfusions in general, which overall reduces the risk of transfusion reactions and, and costs. Another study that tried to look at the differences between 20,000 and 10,000, uh, this was a smaller study that only included 78 patients and hematological patients, showed the same thing. Um, there was no significant difference between 10 and 20,000. So why do we still want to go with this myth? But, you know, what are the other sources that support this 20,000 threshold? You know, being a resident, one of our go-to sources is up to date. I also found that um, the guidelines from the National Blood Authority in Australia has similar recommendations. And like I said, ASCO had that line saying, high risk features such as fevers should increase the threshold. And this other journal from Hematologica mentions that as well. So when you look up up-to-date transfusion, uh, platelet transfusions, you know, this is the first thing we see. You know, active bleeding patients, that goes back to the original range of like 50,000, 10,000, or 100,000 for certain cases. But it says, mentions fever, and we use a higher threshold in those patients, maybe 20,000 to 30,000 in patients that are febrile or septic. And here, you know, they didn't really clearly say why or where's the evidence, but upon, upon further digging, you know, there's other papers that they refer to that supports that statement. Um, and that first one from the uh, article called The Effects of Hyperthermia on Platelet Physiology, um, it, they showed that when comparing platelet levels at different temperatures, uh, platelet function and overall um, platelet um, abundance in each unit uh, was different. So they thought that the implications of pathogenesis on hemorrhage in febrile patients or in the setting of fever, um, we have to really pay attention to the overall numbers of uh, platelet abundance. Um, and then the next paper from the Australia guidelines said that, you know, same thing, tr regularly you can transfuse if it's less than 10,000, but, you know, with risk factors are there, such as fever, you should increase it to 20,000. So a lot of guidelines keep bringing up high risk fever, increase to 20,000. Same thing for uh, ASCO, like I showed earlier. But where is this coming from? So they actually did a uh, trial called the TOPS trial. It was a trial of prophylactic versus no prophylactic platelet transfusions in heme patients. And they saw that patients with a t uh, temperature of 38 uh, degrees Celsius actually had higher risk of bleeding overall. However, within the study, they did not look at the different thresholds. They just either gave prophylaxis or not. Uh, this is a, the guideline from uh, the British Journal of Hematology, and it kind of goes back to mentioning the 20,000 threshold for patients that have fever or infection. And they keep quoting this study, Estcourt et al., from 2012. Um, and then another evidence or supporting evidence they used to go for this increased threshold was the fact that they did a study in mice that, you know, they caused thrombocytopenia, thrombocytopenia in mice and compared bleeding risk in these mice when they were having fevers, and they showed that thrombocytopenic mice, if febrile, bled more than if it was a normal mice with normal platelet counts. Once again, they did not really stratify the platelet levels, and this was only done in mice. So, you know, this was deferred from an animal trial. So a lot of things have just been hearsay, really. Um, in this other journal from blood transfusion, 
um, they mentioned that there are effects of the fevers and bleeding in thrombocytopenic patients. And this mentions the TRAP, uh, TRAP trial, which was a trial of reduced alloimmunization to platelets. It was a large study. It was randomized. And they were looking at the various factors uh, under patients that were, you know, 533 patients after 6,000 6, transfusions. And they showed that there was a modest reduction in post-platelet uh, increments, transfusion increments, after one hour and after 24 hours. And overall refractoriness increased if the patients had a fever. Uh, uh, hazard ratio was 2.12. Um, so, you know, there is a very modest reduction in the overall platelet increase after a transfusion in the setting of fever, but that modest reduction, you know, is, doesn't really make a big difference for us if between these patients if they're not really bleeding. Discrepancies. So this is a table that was drawn out from the uh, British guidelines. And, you know, this table really talked about various studies that they looked at that included fever and thrombocytopenia and bleeding risks. Um, so the first one um, from Stanworth et al, it was a randomized controlled trial with around 400 patients. And what they saw was really bleeding risk increased when there are fever uh, or higher temperatures in the patients. But this study failed to look at, at what level of platelet counts did they bleed. And even then, um, that one did show some uh, statistical significance in that when they were looking at it. The next one was the Friedman et al. trial. This was a retrospective observational study that looked at almost 3,000 patients. Um, they were looking at aggressive therapeutic use of blood products rather than prophylactic use. And it showed no statistical significance, which means, you know, instead of just transfusing them prophylactically, maybe we should just treat them when they're actually um, bleeding. And there's shown no major differences despite uh, a febrile setting in those patients. And then the other one next is uh, Lawrence et al. from 2001 was a prospective interventional study. They looked at 141 patients. And for that one, they, they concluded that hemorrhage was not increased with a lower uh, threshold and that 10,000 should is safe and effective as when compared to the 20,000 threshold. And finally, this one from Weber et al was a retrospective analysis and well, out of the 255 patients, they did find some statistically significant evidence that bleeding is increased, the risk of bleeding increases with body temperature increasing. Um, the higher range of like 38 degrees Celsius to 38.4 was greater than or equal to the 38.5 Celsius and was overall there's less bleeding if you were less than 37.5 degrees Celsius. But overall, after all that evidence and uh, support from this guideline, they do say that's on, right here on the side, like consider the, increasing the threshold for prophylactic platelet transfusions to between 10 and 20,000 in patients judged to have additional risk factors for bleeding. And this is a recommendation grade of 2C, which honestly means it's pretty weak and there needs to be more evidence that really actually looks into this. This is a, the a, AABB, which I believe is like the American Blood Bank Association. Um, and this is their recommendations for platelet transfusions overall. Um, and it's, within the study, they showed that 10,000 has been the more uh, traditional threshold these days. And the risk of bleeding is actually not until it's less than 5,000. And just looking at overall risk, uh, risks with transfusions, uh, this paper popped up and really stuck with me because this all, this whole myth for me at least, started in the ICU. You know, platelet transfusions in patients with sepsis and thrombocytopenia. Within this study, they looked at um, 677 patients that received platelet transfusions, and they saw that compared to with no transfusions, there was an increased risk of 20 at a 28 all-cause mortality with um, transfusions, and there's an increased risk of 90-day all-cause mortality overall. And within this paper, they mentioned, you know, the increased risk of transfusions lead to the risk of transfusion reactions, higher risk of death, and side effects. 
um, that we're always concerned with in the ICU, such as volume overload, ARDS, and other transfusion reactions. Oh, and infection as well. So overall, would you transfuse for a platelet count of less than 20,000 in the setting of fever? You know, there are various guidelines and databases that recommend increasing a platelet transfusion threshold to 20,000 in the setting of fever. You know, and where does this come from was a study that found higher temperatures increase the risk of refractoriness and others showing higher temperatures increase the risk of bleeding in mice. There's also limited evidence that directly look at uh, platelet counts thresholds during fevers and bleeding events. And at the end of the day, for us clinical practitioners, we need to consider the cost overall transfusion reaction events and complications such as uh, uh, venous thromboembolisms that can affect uh, the patient's overall quality of life. So for me, at, after all this reading and looking at all these papers, I honestly think it's better to just keep the threshold at 10,000 and not 20,000, even though they might have fevers, just because costs, reactions, and other side effects. And these are my references. So um, this actually came up recently on rounds, and I, you know, I, um, I had never even heard this before that the threshold should be higher in patients with fever. Um, when I was training, it was twenty thousand was the threshold that we used to do, and then over the years, these some of these other studies came out, and the threshold was lowered to ten for prophylactic transfusion, and I thought it was ten. Period. You know, if they're not bleeding, that's it. You know, there's no exceptions or changes. And um, I don't know if the attendings here, I, the residents, probably don't remember all that. But um, we were rounding on a patient in the unit, happened to be my patient, and it was a, a hemonc patient, I think, and um, had a low platelet count. And the hematologist, oncologist had recommended that we transfuse below 20,000, not 10,000, because the patient had a fever. And I had never heard that before. I don't know, have, Dr. Jose, have you, have you heard this? I've heard that uh, you should change the threshold, but I heard it from the oncologist. I didn't know the data. Yeah, okay. So um, anyway, does anybody have any questions or comments other than the comments I just made? Yes, Dr. Gerstoff. So Eddie, I thought it was a great presentation. I was wondering if, aside from the last study you quoted, if any of the other studies broke down the source of the fever, the sepsis versus from a malignancy versus rheumatological fever, drug reactions, anything like that? They didn't break it up. Um, they did not uh, stratify those risks. They kind of grouped it all together as fever in general. And do you think that might make a difference? Um, I think so. Uh, they're, well, within some of those stratifications, they did break up infection and just higher temperature overall. And uh, the numbers did vary. But I, I don't know if there's enough evidence for me to say specifically. Ariel? In the studies with mice, it was just any level of platelets that were below normal? Yeah, so uh, they just <laughs> it induced uh, thr thrombocytopenia. I, I think it was up to 12,000 is the platelet count that they went to compared to like 150,000. I think in that my mouse study, what they did from what I remember is they shaved the back of the mice and created a chemical burn on the back of the mouse and then did the study um, and they had found they had there was more bleeding into the inflamed wound. Um, I don't think that's really prophylactic. You know, that's that's something with an actual injury, right? That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about prophylaxis, people that don't have something that's going to bleed like a procedure. So I don't know how applicable, is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. Other variables besides fever at the same time as thrombocytopenia, I have read before that uh, anemia, significant anemia, just having less red cells is part of 
uh, ability to form a, a cloth or you know plugging a bleeding vessel. I don't know if you came across that as well as you know a possible reason to raise the transfusion threshold. I know it wasn't the topic, but it is a similar thing. If the patient has a hemoglobin of 7.2 and they have thrombocytopenia, should we be completely transfusing them at a, a higher threshold? I did see references of that where when people were anemic, um, less than seven or even less than 10, they had more episodes of bleeding, but I did not look at um, direct studies that looked at both thrombocytopenia and anemia at the same time. I guess the only other comment I have is that I always thought sepsis was a prothrombotic state, so I'm not sure, you know, I know the, one of the questions was about the etiology of the fever, was it sepsis or something else? And I, I don't know, I mean, we used to give activated protein C, right, in, in septic patients, and it, it, because the coagulation system is really intimately integrated with the inflammatory system. And, um, and it, usually the, you talk about microthrombi and thrombotic state, not a bleeding state. So I, don't, I, I also wonder what the etiology of the fever was in these patients, but they never really said on most of them these studies. Okay, so any other questions before we vote? Okay, so is it a myth that prophylactic platelet transfusion through uh, threshold for patients with fever should be 20,000 rather than 10,000? So how many people think that this is true? We should keep doing what these recommendations are. How many think it's um, plausible. So there's actually a fair number of people who think it's plausible. How many think it's probably not true? And how many think it's not true? It's just busted, out and out. All right. Well, I think plausible uh, seems to take the day here. Yeah. So, and I think the bottom line is there really isn't any good evidence one way or the other. And I understand why people think that it's still plausible. Um, so this is...